Katie Davis is an associate professor at the University of Washington and the director of the UW Digital Youth Lab. For nearly 20 years, she has been researching the impact of digital technologies on young people's learning development and well being. She uses the insights from her research to design positive technology experiences for youth and their families. At the University of Washington, she mentors undergraduate and graduate students and teaches courses on child development and technology design. Dr. Davis holds two master's degrees and a doctorate in human development and education from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Katie Davis. Thank you so much for joining me this evening, and hello to everybody online, including my son Oliver, who's watching. <laughs> um, let's make sure I can do this. There we go. So let's jump right in. So I'm coming to this work and the book that I wrote um, wearing two hats, and I just want to pause here and invite you to consider what are the hats, the hat or hats that you're wearing right now. Um, when it comes to considering technology's role in child development. So I'm a researcher um, and I co-direct the Digital Youth Lab at the University of Washington. Um, I'm also a parent of Oliver, hello Oliver. Um, and Oliver is six years old and in kindergarten here at Green Lake Elementary. Um, and so in the book, I really bring those two hats um, to look at this topic of technology and children. So as a researcher for nearly 20 years now, I can't believe it, I've been studying the role of technology in different areas of um, children's lives, their learning, their development, their well-being. Um, and from that perspective, I've really been a social scientist just trying to understand what's going on. Um, but at the information school, I'm surrounded by computer scientists who are building things. And so I sort of caught that bug. And so a lot of my work is not just focused on understanding what kids are doing with technology, but also designing new technologies that support their learning and development. And throughout my work, I've been very comfortable with phrases like this when it comes to researching kids and technology. There is no one easy answer. Is technology good or bad? It really depends. It's complicated. Um, technology is complicated. Kids are complicated. On the one hand, on the other hand, there's a lot of that out there. And for most of my career, I've been very comfortable. I've, I've really leaned into the complexity of the research. Um, and most of the time when my friends, some of whom are in the audience here, when they've asked me, so what's the verdict? Is it good or bad? I've usually given one of these answers. Um, and felt pretty good about it. And then six years ago, I became a parent myself, and I realized that that sort of nuanced version of um, is it good or bad wasn't really helping me make concrete decisions about how many episodes of Paw Patrol should I let Oliver watch? Or when should I introduce him to video games? When should he get a phone? All of these things were not really answerable by saying, well, it's really complicated, it's nuanced. And so I started to wonder, well, is there anything concrete, anything useful that my research has shown me <laughs> um, that could help me as a parent? So um, it was this tension between my role as a parent and my role as a researcher that really motivated me to write Technology's Child. I wanted to explore whether there was anything concrete that we could distill from this complex research landscape um, that parents could use, me <laughs> as well, um, but also teachers, technology designers, um, and policymakers who are thinking about how should the tech industry be regulated right now. Um, so this book is really my attempt to bring together those two roles um, and answer the question, is it good or is it bad? So as a developmental scientist, I wanted to look at the full arc of child development from early childhood all the way through to emerging adulthood. Um, and that's a really large um, 
a large undertaking. So for each stage of development, I decided to zoom in on a couple of areas of development that were particularly salient and important. So in early childhood, um, the ability to self-regulate, to develop your executive function is really key and, and really sets the stage for later development, um, as is early literacy. So those two were the areas that I focused on for early childhood. Moving into middle childhood, I looked at the role of play in development, learning. As kids move into the tween and teen years, I looked at changing family relationships, peer relationships, identity development, which becomes very salient in the teen years, and then civic engagement during um, both adolescence and emerging adulthood. And so for each of these areas of development, I pulled on research um, about what is it that kids really need to be able to thrive and be set up in, in a good position developmentally. So I took that and then I put it into conversation with the best and latest research that we have on technology's impact on kids at these different stages of development. And I drew on many different fields. So I looked at human-computer interaction, I looked at computer science, learning sciences, developmental science, and I just wanted to see what are all of these different disciplines learning about technology and children. I also brought in a lot of my research. Um, most of my research has focused on um, identity development during adolescence and learning through technology. Um, and also the impact of technology on children's well-being. And it was a lot, a lot of research that I tried to wrangle. So in the book, there are 672 footnotes and over 1,000 citations. So it is a, a large amount of research that I was tackling. And at times, I did feel like it was pretty unwieldy. And I felt like I was getting caught in the weeds of all of this. But what kept me focused was this question. When does technology support child development, and when does it not? Um, and so throughout my writing of the book, I was really focused on this question. Um, and I found that although the research is complex, there are a lot of it depends kind of answers. It's complex. It's complicated. Um, but even so, I was able to detect a signal in all of that complexity. And it can really be stated in a single sentence, which is this two-step framework. So self-directed, community-supported digital experiences are best for children's healthy development. And so in my talk, I'm going to dig into each of these um, components, self-directed and community-supported, and bring in a few examples from my book. So we're going to start with self-directed technology experiences. So these are experiences that place children in the driver's seat of their digital experiences and interactions. And so one of the examples I explore in the book is children's digital play. Um, and as I do in the book, I just want to start off by just reflecting on, well, why is play important to development? Um, we think that kids are just going off to play. They're not much is really happening, but actually a ton is happening. They're, they're learning all sorts of skills. They're learning to think symbolically, um, move from concrete thinking to symbolic thinking. They're learning counterfactual reasoning. What if I did this, or what if I had done something else? They're learning that other people have different perspectives than they do, theory of mind. Interpersonal skills, negotiating questions of fairness, right or wrong, if they're playing with other kids. Um, and through that, they're developing their moral sensibility. When things don't go their way, they're learning to regulate their emotions. So th those are just some. There are more skills, but there are ton there's tons of learning that's going on during play. Um, but not all play experiences are created equal, and not all play experiences are equally supportive of these kinds of skills. So the question is, what kinds of play experiences are best for children's development? And so let's take Oliver and his stepsister, Philippa, um, and here you see them in the height of the pandemic when we were living in Berlin. And if you're anything like us, you had a lot more cardboard boxes in your home um, than before the pandemic. So we had a ton of cardboard boxes, and Oliver and Philippa found many different uses for them. 
And if you think about the kind of play that kids get themselves involved in um, with cardboard boxes and just things that are lying around the house, it's very open-ended, it's very self-directed. Um, they're really in control of their play experience. They decide what they're going to do, what kind of world they want to create, um, and how they're going to engage with each other. And so one way of thinking about the affordances of playing with things like cardboard boxes is with the concept of loose parts. Um, and this is a, a term that I came across when I was reading um, a fantastic book called The Design of Childhood um, by Alexandra Lang. I, I recommend this book. But she brought up this idea that was first developed by a sculpture art um, professor named Simon Nicholson. And Nicholson talked about how the more loose parts there are in children's environments, um, the better, the, the, more, the richer their play experiences. So they can create their own worlds. Um, they're really in control rather than being led by the design of someone else's world. Um, and it's within this sort of self-directed kind of play um, where these important skills are developed, things like emotion regulation and symbolic thinking. Um, and if you think you know, of other loose parts, perhaps sand is the ultimate loose part. So if kids are outside playing with sand or rocks, maybe inside with paper clips or things like that, just anything where they can decide what this is going to be and what sort of world they're going to create. Um, that's loose parts play. But the question is then, do loose parts exist in digital form? And so to answer this question, I want to take a look at two examples um, of different digital play experiences. And if Oliver's still watching, he will recognize both of these because they are on his iPad right now. Um, so over the last couple of years, Oliver has enjoyed at some point or the other playing with each of these apps. One is Peppa's Paintbox, and one is Paw Patrol Rescue Run. But as I'll show, the kind of play experiences that they offer are actually quite different. So if we take Peppa's Paintbox, we can start to see Oliver here. He's about to open it up, the app, and he's taken automatically to a blank canvas. Um, and so you might even think of that blank canvas as its own form of loose part. He can do anything with it. It's his to decide. And he decides that he wants to paint his um, blank canvas blue because that's his favorite color. And so he chooses a blue paint can and he, it's blue. And then he chooses a paintbrush and this one is pretty cool because it's multicolored. And he just can draw free form and then he can go through pick out some stamps that are related to the story. So he really likes the flower pots that are animated and they grow up. And after a little bit more, I sort of fast forward through this part. He, it's a very busy final picture, but it's his picture and he's decided what he wants on it. So it probably won't make its way to the Louvre, but he likes it. Um, and he's, importantly, he's the one who is in control. He created that, he decided when he was finished. It's a very different story when he's playing Paw Patrol Rescue Run. So I'm not gonna show a, a, a video of him playing, but I am gonna highlight some key features of Paw Patrol Rescue Run. So when you open up this app, automatically you get to decide between one of a few missions. And they're all slightly different, but the general idea is the same. You have to go through um, a particular um, course it's a set course. Um, you have to do it as efficiently as possible. You have very minimal things that you can do. It's pretty much a forward trajectory that you have to go on. Um, throughout your mission, you have to collect as many pup treats as possible, earn as many badges as you can. Um, the promise of more pup treats, the po promise of more badges is very compelling to kids, including Oliver. And so usually he plays this until I tell him, don't play it anymore. Whereas with Peppa's paint box, when he's done with his picture, he's pretty much done with the, um, the app. And it really resembles the kind of analog play experience where generally young kids, after 15 or 20 minutes, they're ready to move on to something else. Um, 
So with Paw Patrol Rescue Run, it's very different. His attention seems to be completely co-opted. Um, and importantly, when I try and talk to Oliver when he's playing this, he just tunes me out. Whereas with pa um, Peppa's paint box, um, he is open to having a conversation with me. So when we put these two play experiences side by side and ask who's in control, the child or the app, I would argue that Peppa's paint box provides a more self-directed experience. It's more open-ended, it's self-directed, self-paced rather than system-paced, so um, Oliver can go as quickly or as slowly as he wants. Um, there are a lot of loose parts, there's different paint colors, there's different paint um, implements that he can use. Importantly, there is an absence of dark patterns. And so these are things like time pressures, game characters, virtual rewards, navigation constraints um, that make it difficult for kids to be able to put down or exit the platform. So in some apps, there are characters who will cry if you um, exit out of the app. Um, navigation constraints, there are things that make it difficult to even find your way home so that you're kind of stuck there playing the game. Um, so all of these dark patterns are actually specific design decisions that designers put in to really keep people playing and on their platform. Um, they really want you to stay on, um, and that's more important than somebody's well-being. And so generally speaking, this question, who is in control, the child or the technology, is really key to determining whether a digital experience is self-directed or not. And it really applies across child development and with many different kinds of digital experiences. And hopefully, through my discussion of these two examples uh, um, of Peppa's Paint Box and Paw Patrol Rescue Run, hopefully you can understand and see how important design is. The way that these two apps have been designed really transforms and dictates the kind of experience and whether or not it's self-directed or not. And so before I move on to slightly older kids, I want to add one coda to this discussion. Um, so I think it's worth noting that digital loose parts are not quite as loose as loose parts in the analog world. So if you look at this juxtaposition here, um, when Oliver and Philippa are painting in an analog world, they can mix paints to their heart's content and create many different shades of paint. You can't really do that with Peppa's paint box. There's, um, there's just maybe five or six different colors and there's really no mixing. Of course, there are drawing apps where you can mix, but that really depends on whether or not the designer has programmed that ability in. And even if you can mix, there's going to be some sort of a limit um, that, that digital, um, the digital world requires. So generally speaking, loose parts are easier to find somewhat in the analog world and a little bit um, looser than they are in the digital world. Okay, so we're gonna move on into adolescence. Um, so now that we've got a sense of what a self-directed digital experience um, looks like, at least in early childhood, let's take a look at what it might look like for older kids as they're moving into their tween and teen years. And here I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper into not just how design matters, but also how the individual children who are interacting with technology matter, and also their surrounding context. Because as much as design really does matter, there's a lot else going on as well that, that is going to affect whether a digital experience is positive or not. So as I did with play, I, I start by considering, well, what's going on during adolescence? Um, and there's a lot. There's changing family relationships. So um, as kids enter early adolescence, they start to move away from their parents um, a bit, not disconnecting totally. So they're figuring out what's the right level of connection with their parents while they establish their autonomy. And that process is called individuation. Um, they're focusing more, spending more time on their um, peer um, relationships, and in the context of their peer interactions, they're figuring out who they are, who, what is their identity, what identity do they wanna take on, what kinds of roles are they gonna take on in the world, what is their career gonna be, um, what civic roles are they gonna take on. And a lot of this is happening 
um, in, a, in the context of the digital environments. So social media, their phones, um, and so forth. And I want to underscore just how important all of these things are for teens. If you might think of all of these things, figuring out your autonomy, your peer relationships, your identity. You might think of this as adolescent's job. And that job that they have is every bit as important as your job or my job. Um, and so I think it's, it's very easy to dismiss what teens are doing online and, and offline sometimes. Um, but when they're with their friends, when they're expressing themselves, it's, they're doing really critical developmental work. So what makes digital experiences more or less self-directed for teens? Um, so loose parts may not apply exactly to social media, but the concept of agency certainly does. And again, it comes down to who's in the driver's seat, the teen or the technology. So first I want to focus on the good stuff, because a lot of my research does focus on the great things that teens are doing online and with social media. So they're developing their interests and their skills, whether that's learning recipes on TikTok or honing their music skills. Right now, Oliver's loving learning to draw um, with YouTube tutorials. Um, I know he's not a teen yet, but you know, similar concept. Um, they're exploring and finding their identities and who they want to be. Um, and Importantly, for kids who are experiencing marginalized identities, they have an easier time finding community online, often. Not always, but often. They're connecting with others, again, finding that community and really figuring out um, who they want to be. A lot of them are expressing their civic voices as well. And including one of um, my younger siblings, Molly. So I talk about Molly in one of the chapters in my book um, as an example of the opportunities that are available for youth, particularly with marginalized identities. Um, now, I feel like I need to give a caveat here because um, I'm, so Molly is quite a bit younger than I am. So Molly is a member of Generation Z. Um, they were born um, 17 years before me. I won't I'll let you do the math, but I'm comfortably in Generation X. Um, Molly had a starring role in my first book, The App Generation, when they were in high school. Um, and shortly after I wrote The App Generation, Molly came out to me in their senior year as liking girls more than boys. And then while I was writing this book, Molly um, told me that they were using they, them pronouns and exploring a trans identity. And Molly's story is unique, unique to Molly. But some of the themes that came out as I interviewed Molly for this book were very much resonant um, of the themes from my research, and particularly my research of fan fiction communities and teens who were very active on sites like Tumblr. And I actually learned, and I didn't know this before, um, but Molly was very active in Tumblr when they were younger. And Tumblr was a really important site for exploring and figuring out who they were. And so if you're not familiar with the social media site Tumblr, um, it's a site where a lot of people go to share their love of different fandoms, um, you know, whether that's Harry Potter or whatever, whatever media franchise that you love. Um, you can, you, I'm sure you can find it on Tumblr. There's also a really um, social justice sensibility on Tumblr. And Molly really found this sense of validation um, for the identity that they felt inside. And um, not only did they feel a sense of validation, but they also just started by reading fan fiction, by watching people interact with each other. It gave them a frame for just cognitively understanding what they were feeling inside. And all of a sudden, whereas they were feeling at their school offline, sort of not quite right and not comfortable sharing who they knew they were inside, online and particularly on Tumblr, they felt, oh, all of what I'm feeling is okay. So Molly really was able to use their online experiences um, in a self-directed way. Now, 
Absolutely not everything was rosy and wonderful online for Molly, um, but I wanted to underscore at least that there was this component that was really validating and was really quite different from their experiences in their school. We both went to the same school, not at the same time, but um, we grew up on a small island in the Atlantic, very British, very proper, um, all-girls school, and Molly certainly didn't feel comfortable um, being able to express their identity there. So, I'm going to move on here. So, what I would say is that for too many teens, although they are certainly experiencing positive experiences like Molly did, for too many teens, they're also experiencing a lot of stressful things online, and particularly with social media, and also more one-on-one -on -one communications online, such as group chat and things like that. And so, my research and research of others shows that too often, it's very difficult for teens to feel like they're in the driver's seat of their social media experiences. And again, part of this reason comes down to design, although certainly not the whole story is about the design. Um, but the way technologies design are designed really does matter here. So let's consider some specific designs of social media that have an influence on how teens experience their social media interactions and actually how we all can experience social media. So if you consider just a few concrete features, such as the ability to scroll infinitely, you know, way back in the beginning of social media, you weren't able to scroll infinitely. That's relatively a new um, feature that has been added. And if you add that and consider it in combination with algorithmically curated feeds, again, it hasn't always been the case that our feeds were algorithmically curated. They used to be chronologically, and it's actually really hard if you want your feed to be chronologically displayed. It's really hard and sometimes impossible to do so. So that, those two combinations, the ability to an endlessly scroll through your feed, plus having a feed that's tailored to what the algorithm knows will catch your attention, that can be a huge pull on a teen's attention. It's a huge pull on our attention, but teens are still developing their self-control toolbox, and so it's even harder for them to disengage. And if you consider metrics like likes and comments and tagging on posts, all of these kinds of metrics are things that feed the algorithm. They're, they also call attention to who's popular, who's in, who's out, um, what's trending, and the notifications that are delivered repeatedly to teens' phones, probably to your phones too, call attention and kind of signal that these likes and these comments and these tags are really important. And if you're not getting a lot, you're not doing so well. So all of these features, and then there are lots of other things. Just think about filters, you know, tons of filters. I could have a whole page on just the different kinds of filters on social media. But all of these features combine to dictate what is done on social media, what's possible to be done, um, what is seen, who is seen, and also what is valued. And importantly, what is done, what is seen, and what is valued usually is what captures attention and not necessarily what supports a feeling of self-direction. And so one way that I offer in the book to think about how design interacts with individual teens and their motivations and their goals is through thinking about these three layers of tech. And so if you think about the bottom layer first as the features, like things that I showed on the previous slide, the infinite scroll, the likes, the comments, those th sorts of things, they determine the kinds of things that you can do and the things that you can't do. Then if you bring that up to the practice layer, when those features start interacting with teens and their particular goals and motivations, their likes and their dislikes, that determines what's kind of happening at that layer, the possibilities for, act um, for action. And then, in time, as enough um, practice builds up, that starts to develop an actual culture on these sites. So if you go to Tumblr, it's gonna feel very different from 
Instagram, which feels different from TikTok. Um, and that in turn feels different from Be Real. All of these platforms have different cultures. And then within the platforms, there are many different cultures as well. So this is one way that I think about how the actual individual features combine and interact with human behavior. And so this discussion also points to the fact that yes, design matters, but also the people who are using the technology matter too. And so although there are clearly patterns that we see across teens when it comes to their social media use, it's, a, it's not the case that every teen reacts in the same way in their social media experience. And that's because not all teens are the same and they don't all experience the same social context. So let's just consider two hypothetical teens, okay? And they are looking at the exact same content on TikTok, but they are different teens. One teen has a vulnerability to body dissatisfaction and the other teen doesn't. Maybe they're both looking at very um, idealized, highly filtered, airbrushed images, um, very attractive images. The teen with the vulnerability is probably gonna react a lot differently than the teen who doesn't have that vulnerability. In another hypothetical, let's say you have two similar teens and they both have a vulnerability to body dissatisfaction, but they have different surrounding contexts. So maybe one teen has a, a person, maybe a friend or an adult in their life who is there to support them and maybe help them to reframe what they're seeing and say, you know what, a lot of effort went into creating those idealized images. Um, or maybe you want to try changing and curating your feed in a different way. So don't follow thin inspiration content and maybe follow body positive content. So that idea that the, the people who are surrounding teens and in their lives, the support that they can give, that brings us to the second part of the framework, which is community support. So the self-direction is all about the individual and whether or not in their, they're in control, but the su community support that is both surrounding and within the digital experience is also extremely important. And so community support are really technology experiences that are supported by other people. And sometimes, as I mentioned, that's surrounding the digital experience, and sometimes that's within. So if we go back to the younger kids and Oliver playing Peppa's paint box, um, a lot, for younger kids especially, a lot of the support that they get when it comes to their digital experiences is gonna come from caregivers. So if you think about the different roles that I can play while Oliver is engaging in these app experiences, I can be a gatekeeper. So I can decide what he has access to and what he doesn't. Um, when he's playing a particular app, I can monitor how he's acting, if he's kind of getting bored, if he seems like he's too engrossed. I can decide how long he gets to play. I can observe how he acts after his digital experience. And then if I think maybe he's a little bit too revved up, maybe we'll you know, take away that app. Um, so the monitoring is really important. Sometimes, if I'm lucky, he lets me join in. Some, for some apps, it's much easier. They're designed to kind of encourage um, joint media engagement. Some apps, it's a little bit harder. Um, and so with Peppa's paint box, it's actually a lot easier for me to engage with Oliver. Sometimes he actually even lets me um, draw with him. That's kind of rare, but he is happy to talk to me about what he's drawing. Sometimes if I recognize something of, in his drawing that reminds me of something we did the day before or the week before, I'll talk about that and then connect his digital experience to other parts of his um, life. Um, and in that way, there's a lot of richness from joint media engagement. Now, when we move into older kids and teens, um, the same roles apply, but so gatekeeper, monitor, joint media engagement. So if you think about tweens in particular, um, parents are often the gatekeeper trying to decide when should I get my kid a phone and what sort of access should I allow them to different social media platforms, should I set screen time limits and so forth families playing video games together, engaging in joint media engagement. But as kids' internal lives become more complex, um, the types of roles and support that they need also becomes a little bit more complex. And so um, for teens in particular, um, asking 
what's going on, um, and then asking again if they don't tell you the first time, and then really listening um, with curiosity and empathy. So again, that goes back to taking their experiences seriously and not just saying, oh, you're wasting time with your friends or you're using all, doing all these selfies, but actually approaching what they're doing and saying, you know what, that's their job. Um, they're doing really important developmental work. Um, that's where you're more likely, if you bring that sort of um, stance to your conversations with teens, you're probably more likely to get some traction and, 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 and engage in a connected way with them. Reframing, so I kind of mentioned that earlier, but helping teens to reframe what they're seeing. Um, so when it comes to social media, observing how much effort it goes in to being an influencer or posting really um, beautiful pictures on Instagram, um, if a friend doesn't respond to your text in immediately, maybe it's not because they don't like you, but maybe they are doing their homework, or maybe their parents don't let them um, have their phone during dinner or something like that. The reframing can be really useful. Um, sharing. So in some of my work, we have talked to parents and we've talked to teens individually about the, the struggles that they have with their phones. And oftentimes, it's very hard to tell the two groups apart because they are having similar struggles with putting their phones down and just feeling that pull. And so I think there's some, really, some real opportunity there for teens and parents to find some common ground um, and share their common struggles. And sometimes that might be developing strategies together. Um, because remember, we're learning about all of this along with teens, and we don't have all of the answers. So for instance, maybe parent and teen both d decide that they're having, or they realize that they're having struggles at nighttime checking their phone during night. Maybe they decide to put their phone in another room. So one thing I want to underscore is I've been talking about the role of parents, but really this support can come from many different people in teens' lives, so, and younger kids as well. Friends, teachers, siblings, extended family members, community members, all of these people can provide community support, so it's not just parents. And sometimes the platform itself can provide support. Um, and so recently, all of these examples here, so putting time limits on how long you can be on a site, um, take a break nudges, all of these things are um, introductions that sites like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube have recently introduced um, to help um, sort of help teens maintain and control their social media use. So YouTube has recently disabled autoplay and set um, teens' accounts to um, private by default. Um, and TikTok has introduced time limits and take a break nudges if, they, if the algorithm notices that teens are scrolling through um, a certain kind of content for a long time. And so this point hopefully calls attention to the fact that community support is not just about individuals providing community support to youth. It's also about institutions. Um, it's about the tech industry providing support. It's about regulation. So all of the examples I showed on the previous slide of take a break nudges, default privacy settings, those, the companies, Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, they all introduced those um, features as a direct result of the UK's um, Age Appropriate Design Code, which was passed a couple of years ago. And so in anticipation of that legislation, these companies scrambled to make a lot of changes. And so it just goes to show that government policy actually plays a really important role. And I'm actually very interested and a, a little bit concerned about where policy ends up going in the US, um, but it certainly, I think, has a role to play because I don't think we can rely on the companies to regulate themselves. Um, so all of these things, parents, peers, teachers, individuals, of course, are very important, um, but we put so much onus on the individuals to figure out these, the solutions to these problems, um, and I think sometimes we're not focusing enough on the tech industry, policymakers, and also researchers. I think researchers have a really important role to play, for instance, by 
guiding policymakers and what are the best kinds of policies? What does um, the best research show will be effective policies to regulate the tech industry? And so this brings me back to the two roles um, that I identify with most closely right now, and that's my parent hat and my researcher hat. And I just want to conclude my talk by reflecting on how I'm using this two-step framework in each of these roles. And so first I want to start off as a researcher, what I'm doing right now. So my current work um, is focused on identifying specific designs and, and design interactions um, that support and undermine healthy development and trying to um, design technology experiences, particularly for teens and particularly in the context of social media, that support well-being rather than undermine it. And then my collaborators and I are also right now investigating ways to detect as close to real time as possible when um, things are going well for teens as they're engaging in social media and when they're not going so well. And I think that the insights from that can really be useful to help guide future design and perhaps even policy. And then as a parent, I honestly really use this framework every day as a tool to help guide my concrete decisions around Oliver's tech use. So I'm asking daily, is it self-directed? Is it community supported? And as I ask those questions, I really do feel like I'm putting the research to work for my specific situation and my individual child. And then all of a sudden, the complex becomes concrete and I have a better sense, at least, of when to turn off Paw Patrol. However, this picture here, you might notice that it's taken in an airport. And when we're in an airport, all bets are off. There is no limit to Paw Patrol in an airport or on an airplane. Um, and then finally, as a parent, I'm also trying to learn to be a good enough digital parent. And I wanted to just end on this, um, this idea, especially for you parents or grandparents out there, um, the idea actually comes from a mid-20th century pediatrician, Donald Winnicott, and he actually talked about the good enough mother. But I've updated, I hope that he would be okay with talking about the good enough parent in the 21st century. Um, and really the idea is that parents actually do a disservice to their kids if they are there to respond to every bid for attention. So if their kid is really upset or distraught about something, and if the parent's there to calm them down every single time, they're not gonna learn how to calm themselves down. If they're really bored and they just don't know how to get unbored, and if the parent is always there to suggest the next activity, well then they're never gonna learn how to get themselves on, unbored. So the idea is that actually you shouldn't just settle for imperfection as a parent, you should embrace it, not as an excuse to shirk your parenting duties, but actually as a way to build resilience, both in your child, but also as you, in, as, as a parent. And so if you bring that idea into the digital realm, a good enough digital parent realizes they're not gonna be perfect at this. We're all still learning, we're all figuring out. There's a lot of unsettled questions out there. A good enough parent does their best. They're kind of like scientists. They try things out. Maybe they'll read a review or two on Common Sense Media, but they probably don't have time to read all of them. Um, they try things out, they observe what, how their kids react, they observe how they react if they're on their phone while trying to parent, and they adjust course accordingly. Um, they also aren't too hard on themselves, so there is research showing that if parents are highly distracted while they're parenting, um, that can interfere with attachment but the occasional glance at your phone is not going to derail your child's development. Um, also, digital, good enough digital parents realize that they didn't create these problems and it's not, it sh it's not and it shouldn't be all on them to solve it. And so they also look outward to the community and to the society for help and support. And so I want to end with asking about you. What about you? Um, what are the roles that you thought of at the beginning of this talk, and how might you use the two-step framework in those roles to support the youth in your life? 
And I'll just end by um, noting that actually over there, I have a sign-up sheet if you're interested in getting a parent handout. Um, you don't have to be a parent to get it. Uh, you can just give your email and I will send you an electronic copy. Um, the parent handout has resources that I've been curating um, uh, to help guide parents through this tricky territory, plus some summaries of key ideas um, for parents that are related to the book. Um, and also, if you want to learn more about the ideas in the book, I'm often expanding on them through a blog that I maintain. Um, and if you just want to learn about what's going on with Technologies Child, please feel free to sign up for my newsletter by going to my website. Um, and I will end there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Davis. Um, we're gonna take questions both online and at the mic here. Um, please use the mic if you're in the room so that we can uh, catch it on the recording and the live stream audience can hear you also. Um, I'm gonna be uh, monitoring the questions submitted online. Um, so I'll read those out and I'll just get us started with one of those. Um, so uh, let's see, the first one, tech in our children's lives is somewhat up to the parents, but it seems like more and more it might be up to schools and how much they rely on tech. Do you have any comment on tech requirements for children in schools? Yeah, so I didn't really talk about, well I didn't talk about schools in this talk, but I do talk about schools a lot in the book. Um, and it's really hard, you know, um, teachers increasingly, I started off as a fourth grade teacher before I went back to grad school, and increasingly more and more is put on teachers um, in terms of not just teaching kids math or English or science, but just attending to their whole lives. So, um, and there's no difference when it comes to technology. Um, I think that, you know, it tends to be that when you have new technologies that are introduced into society, when they start to be introduced into schools, um, there's often a lot of excitement and sometimes some nervousness around uh, what's gonna happen in the school and how might it transform teaching and learning. And actually, more often than not, um, what ends up happening is that instead of the technology transforming what happens in the classroom, the classroom and all of the structures around it end up domesticating the technology. And so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry. I wonder if there's any water. <laughs> oh, oh, wonderful, thank you. Great. <laughs> Yeah, so, so with, um, with the, that's all to say that teachers are often pretty constrained when it comes to using technologies in their class. So right now, you know, the hot technology is ChatGPT, and many school districts across the country have decided to just ban it outright. This is very familiar. This is often what schools do in the context of technologies. And so within that context, it is often tricky for teachers to manage, um, but it's not impossible. And I'll, I'll just sort of leave that teaser. I, I offer some ideas for how teachers can introduce and work with technology thoughtfully in their own classrooms. Hi, Katie, thanks a lot for this. Um, I have something, that, it sounds like a semantic nitpick, but it really is a, an honest question and just a chance to understand your two-step framework better. So what I'm getting so far is that you are encouraging us to ask, is this activity self-directed and is it community supported? Those are the two. Okay, so my, my question is, so to me, two steps implies an order Hmm. Is there an order here, or is it just a two-part framework? Sorry to is sound that, nitpicky. No, 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 that's good. I, I, so, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say it's two-part, although I do think, I do start with how is the child interacting and what are, what's possible and what's not possible. Um, I think that is a good place to start, generally. But, you know, when I decide to let Oliver use an app or watch a certain program or not, I'm using my community support. So often they're happening in tandem. So I appreciate the 
the semantic nitpick. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for that. That was super interesting and very practical. Um, I was wondering about the self-directed. Are there times that you notice, either as, as a researcher or as a parent, that the same activity sometimes feels like it's self-directed and sometimes doesn't? And um, why, why is that? And I'm thinking specifically about texting, <laughs> um, how sometimes texting feels like one of those sure. things that you're not in control of because, I don't know, it's like it's too emotional, like the thing is too, you know, and then other times it feels like, oh, okay, I could put this down. And so I'm just, I'm yes. curious about that. Yeah. Thank you for that question. That is a great question because it really gets at the fact that, yes, there are certain, like texting is its own thing and it's designed in a particular way, um, but one texting session can feel very different from another and that's because of what the individual's bringing to that particular texting session and the context, who they're texting with. Um, and so it, it, you really need to, in order to understand whether that's gonna be self-directed or not, you really need to understand that kid, what they care about, where they are developmentally, what time of day it is, um, and then who they're talking to, what's the surrounding context. Um, and, and without those two pieces, you're not really gonna have a good idea of whether it's self-directed or not. Hi, thanks for the great uh, talk. Uh, one question I had is when you were comparing the two uh, iPad games, the uh, kind of creative painting one and the racing one, it occurred to me that even outside of tech, like even pre-tech kids would sometimes do arts and crafts activities or maybe play a sport or some real world game that was less self-directed too. Totally. And yeah. so I was just curious uh, if you had thoughts about how these same principles apply you know, to parenting or child development, even outside of the tech environment? Yes, that's a great question because that's really important. So I, I noted earlier that there are lots of different kinds of play. And as kids get older, more and more of their play does become rule-based and, you know, in the context of organized sports, for instance. And those kinds of play are valid. And I, also, I'm not saying, and in the book, I'm certainly not arguing don't let kids play video games at all. There's a lot that's actually pretty great about certain kinds of video games. But I think the, the key is to have a mix and to realize that if a child is spending a ton of time playing a particular video game that's highly controlled and dictated by the actual you know, game mechanics and not them, um, that maybe some uh, some balance is a little bit out of whack, and there maybe it's also displacing time when they can have some more self-directed time. But you know, as a parent, I try and aim for some mix. So in the analog world, offline space, we have some mix of board games, which are rule-based and you know very constrained, um, and then just open-ended, rough and tumble play and fantasy play, and then online. Um, same thing, some video games. So Paw Patrol is still on Oliver's iPad. I have no problem with a little bit of it, um, but just not all of his. There's certainly so many other opportunities online um, to have different kinds of digital experiences. Thank you. Thank you for that great talk. And thank you for reviewing all 1,000 citations so that we don't have to. <laughs> um, Technology's Child is clearly very focused on developmental stages and a framework for evaluating kids' um, relationship with technology, but what do you think are the top lessons that parents and other adults can take from this and import into their own like relationship with technology oh, and digital yeah. life? Well, so I, I also do apply this framework to myself too. Um, and, and what has, one, I recently read a book called Stolen Focus, some of you may have heard of it, and I really resonated with it because the author, and I can't remember his name now, um, was really talking this language. He wasn't using self-directed and community supported, but he was talking about mostly adults and his experience with technology, which I really resonated with just like, 
I'm terrible at night. I check my phone and it's just really bad. And, and then when I'm online, you know, try to write a paper or this book, I'm often like looking off at my email and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that this framework really does apply to what we do as well. Like just thinking, am I in control of this? Especially I think if, if most of your work is done in front of a computer and just, I, I challenge you just maybe tomorrow, just observe yourself. Um, I have a colleague, David Levy, in the information school at UW who wrote this great book called Mindful Tech a few years ago and he has some exercises where he encourages you to observe yourself with like your email patterns. Just observe yourself tomorrow and see how many times you're maybe writing something and then you kind of get pulled in one direction. Um, I actually even offline this happens to me where like in the morning when I'm getting ready, I'm doing so many different things and I think if I'm doing all of them at once, it must be going faster. But actually, if I just do one and then the next and then the next, it's just as fast, if not faster. Um, and so, yeah, so observe and just see how self-directed are you really? Um, and then community support, maybe, you know, for adults, we kind of create our own communities. And so it's a little bit different, whereas as a parent, we have to be a little bit more deliberate about the kind of community we're creating for our kids. Um, but that's something that I think about a lot with Oliver is just what kind of support am I providing for him? I'm not, go I'm not the parent who's going to read through every single Common Sense Media review. Um, I'm much more likely to just try a few things out and observe what happens and kind of use this framework to see if we should go in a different direction. So that's my advice. Um, so we're pretty much out of time, but I just want to end on this one other that is online. Um, it says, thank you for the amazing talk. What strategies as a parent do you have to say no to kids when they are too involved? That's hard. Yeah. I mean, first of all, just recognizing to parents it's hard and it's okay if it's a struggle because we all struggle with it. Um, and I think also the pandemic showed us a lot that you know kids across the age range, the age spectrum, their tech use increased astronomically during the pandemic, and it was very hard for a lot of parents to dial that back, um, and sometimes it takes a little bit. Um, so maybe just kind of changing the scenery, uh, like going outside and just really something a little bit drastic like that. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, it, it involves some discomfort as a parent. We don't like it when our kids are upset, um, but sometimes if we take something away from them, they're gonna be upset, but it won't last forever. Um, and I actually recently, I was um, watching, I was at a swim lesson with Oliver, and I noticed that there was this little toddler playing um, with an iPad, and her mother said, okay, it's time to put it off, and she was beside herself. She was so upset, and so I was very curious to see what this parent was gonna do. And she just kind of was very calm, and she's like, I, I understand you're upset, but she just kind of kept on going and packing up. And, and then she started to distract the child by saying, do you think that we should drive home, or should we fly home, or should we take the bus home? And all of a sudden, the child forgot about the iPad, and she was distracted. Um, and so I think, you know, just keeping that in mind, it's not going to be fun, it's not going to be comfortable, but it will pass, and it is worth kind of working through that discomfort um, because you'll get to the other side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I step up and invite everyone over? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Davis, for that. Uh, very informative and clean, beautiful talk. Thank you for your uh, questions. Um, she will be signing books. Katie will be signing books over there at the Third Place Books table. And also, um, uh, Dr. Morris is here to lead our conversation club. If you want to come join for that, just pick up your chair and bring it over and put it in a circle in the library so we can continue talking about this. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Have a great night.